Good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, David uh, Patterson's uh, lecture. I am happy and delighted to introduce this, uh, this evening's lecture. It is also a book launch, book launch of the book Chess in the Jewish Community of uh, Palestine and Israel, a history authored by Dr. Vitale Pilpel, who is a lecturer in the philosophy at Barilani University. And he writes about epistemology, belief change, philosophy of science and philosophical counseling. But his main, uh, main passion and life uh, mission, I would say, is Jewish chess history. We, 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 the common name for the Jewish people is the people of the book. And Avital uh, has devoted his life actually to, to ch Jewish chess history. He, uh, he um, established a Jewish chess blog in which he collected basically every piece of evidence about Jewish players and Jewish uh, 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 activity in the, what was back then the uh, um, mandate of the, uh, uh, the Jewish, the, the uh, British, British mandate of uh, Palestine. Uh, and Dr. Pachar Gindi, who is a senior lecturer at Bedbell College in Israel, but also a clinical psychologist, uh, and also a master chess player, uh, who analyzed, annotated more than 300 games. So these two gentlemen, they joined together forces in order to write, basically, and to create uh, a very important chapter in the history of Jewish chess. So, I look forward to this uh, lecture and thank you. Thank you, Elad. Hi. So thank you very much, Elad, and uh, thank you, Professor Joseph. Uh, also, we Schlanger for inviting us to the David Peterson lectures. It is a, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here. And uh, as Elad says, we're going to present our book. Um, it's a Chess in the Jewish Community in Palestine and Israel. Let me just explain that when we talk about Palestine here, we're talking about the British mandate in Israel. So at that time, the area was called Palestine. And later in 1948, from 1948 onwards, it was called uh, Israel. And so um, our big question, we can you turn to the next one? So when one of the ethos of Zionism was that um, create the new Jew, a Jew that will be different from the diasporic Jew. So if you think about the diasporic Jew, you think about perhaps a skinny man studying the Bible, and and so forth. And they wanted to create a new Jew, a new Jew that will be a man of the land, someone who will be a warrior, uh, who will not be just scholarly, but also much more into the life of the land. And in that sense, a chess doesn't really fit the bill. Even if we talk about sports associations in Israel, they all received names that were very indicative. For example, you can see here the symbol of Hapoel, the laborer. And that's the red symbol that you see over there. That is the man of the land, the laborer, the man of labor. Uh, other associations were called, for example, Samson, after the biblical uh, character, the biblical personality of Shimshon, Samson, who is known for his strength, for his virility. Uh, other associations were called Maccabi, after Judas Maccabeus, Yehuda Maccabi, who was a warrior that fought the Greek. Uh, many associations were called Hakoach, the force, the power. Again, all these names point to the wish to have the new Jew as someone different, not just uh, scholarly, but also very, very physical uh, and so on. And, um, and so there is a contradiction between uh, this uh, ethos and playing chess. We should mention that there is another very important Jewish ethos, and that is the ethos of the Jewish genius. So there is the Hagenius, it's called. And so in that sense, uh, the Jewish people always wanted to promote that and, and chess was always 
very, very popular among Jews. But how do you fit that into, into the new state of Israel, into Zionism, into, uh, into the Yeshu? That's the way that this uh, was called before it was established as a state. And it did. It did uh, flourish and was a huge uh, success. And we can see here some of these successes. So uh, from the 1920s onwards, we see the establishment of many chess clubs in the major cities like Haifa, Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv, but also in little towns and villages uh, all over. Um, for example, in 1925, Eliyahu Shachach talks about the fact that the clubs were spread throughout the country uh, in workers' uh, uh, clubs, a farmers' club, politi political activists who played chess between their discussions and the bourgeois who played chess in their mason houses. So the club spread out. We have chess tournaments, national tournaments, city tournaments, intercity tournaments, uh, uh, and also participation in national event, in international events, excuse me, so, for example, one of the first national teams to ever represent Palestine uh, was in the Chess Olympiad in Warsaw, 1935. Um, and, then, um, and then the culmination of all that, we can see in 1964 in the uh, Olympiad that was uh, uh, hosted by Israel in 1964 with uh, David Ben-Gurion, uh, as you can see in the picture, this one and also in the next one, David Ben-Gurion, the first president, uh, the first prime minister of Israel attending. He was also uh, a very uh, avid chess fan. And one of the successes of that period is uh, the fact that the, the USSR and the USA were both in attendance in that Olympiad. Um, we can also see one of the important uh, Personal, chess personalities in Israel uh, from the 1930s to the 1960s, Moshe Chernyat giving a simultaneous exhibition. Uh, I'll just explain for anyone who, does, who is not familiar with the term, a simultaneous exhibition is where you play uh, uh, about, well, it could be anywhere from 10 to 100 players at the same time. Just as you can see Moshe Chernyat there, moving from one board to the next, playing one move against each player, and continuing was a very nice way to popularize uh, the game. Um, is it your turn now? No, you are one. I'm one. Yeah, I mean, I'm... <laughs> so yes, uh, it is. And uh, the question then is the main thesis of the book is how do you connect chess, this uh, diaspora, an active action? How do you connect it to Zionism? And as you can see, the success here is David Ben-Gurion uh, giving a speech in the first Israeli championship. And here is him actually playing chess. He's just about the world's worst player. That's another story. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm an Israeli Navy ship. Uh, check this out. And the thesis of this book is precisely that there were two parallel and uh, parallel ways which this happened, inwardly and outwardly. Inwardly, to convince the Zionists in Palestine, the Zionist movement, that chess, yes, is part of Zionism, and outwardly to convince the Jews of the world, and more precisely, the chess playing Jews of the world. You may know that um, Jews were always prominent in chess, just to give an example of the first uh, five or seven, of the first 10 world champions or 12 world champions, and more than half were Jews. It depends how you define Jew. Uh, and among the top, you know, top leaders of the, until, until very quite recently, and still today, uh, a very large portion, massively over, Jews were massively <laughs> represented among chess masters. And the second part then is outwardly, how to convince the Jewish chess playing community in general and the top masters of chess masters, the top Jewish chess masters in particular, that chess in Palestine or in the early state of Israel is important and they should support it. And this was the inward Jew, one with an eye towards the Zionist 
Palestine. The second one had an eye towards the diaspora jewelry and diaspora jewelry chestware. And how did they solve this? And this is the main thesis in the book, right? They were at little. Back, 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 back. Another one back. Two more back, right? Another one back. Thank you. So, inwardly, the idea was this How can we justify chess when it is such a diaspora activity? Well, the idea was towards the Zionists was not to emphasize chess itself, was to all, but to emphasize the fact that it is played and organized in Eretz Israel or Palestine, the Jewish state. And therefore, it's always the first, not the first Jewish chess player, but always the first Jewish club, the first Jewish tournament, the first time a Jewish team is sent to, to a tournament abroad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, Judaism was Every Jewish achievement, every achievement from you know live chess games to Olympiad appearances, the chess Olympiad is the equivalent of the regular Olympiad, right? International teams compete, uh, was a small part of the revival of Jewish national life for the first time in 2000 years. Right? And, that and that was inwardly to convince the Jews in Palestine, outwardly towards the Jews of the diaspora. What we want to see here is, for example, uh, is a fundraising uh, poster, not really to chess, of course, about how Jews in Europe should give money to Zionism, to the new Jew, right, with the rifle and the, and the sight, right, uh, is to show Zionist chess players, right, as pioneers, despite the fact that they were not necessarily that strong. They were good masters, but not world class. They, the point was that the Jewish chess players in the world should support them and should support chess in Palestine in general because they are pioneers and they are the vanguard of the Jews in the, of, of Jews in, the, in, in chess, just like the Jews here are vanguards of Jews. Zionism is the vanguard of Judaism in general. Okay, and this really is the thesis in the book, and this had. Two vectors, two people who are very quickly, I will say, two people who very, very uh, symbolize this are two very important activists of this period from the 1920s to 1940s, 50s. The first one is Alia Leo Moyerville, who was the head of the, of the Lasker Chess Club in Jerusalem. And he was, in fact, his grandfather was a Zionist before Zionism existed. He was part of the, the lovers of Zion, Zion from the 1870s, before the word Zionism was even coined. And his family was in Jerusalem for before the first Zionist Congress, right? He was really an elite uh, Zionist, you know, the Zionist nobility, so to speak. And he headed to a great degree the idea of accepting Jews. Uh, Accepting Jewish chess as Zionist inside. On the other hand, we have Moshe Malmosh, Menachem Mendel Malmosh, sorry, who was a Zionist from abroad. He came in 1920s to Palestine. He first worked as a bricklayer, right? The, the new Jew, for, by the way, for the electric company. Later on, he advanced to a clerk, right? <laughs> but uh, all his life. And, uh, but really, he was a he also was a newspaper man, edited a column, a regular column, went with the Jewish team to the Olympia in 1936 in Marsha and so on and so forth, and did everything he can to invite players abroad and so on and so forth and to connect chess to uh, chess abroad, Jewish chess abroad to chess in Palestine. So these were two most important people. So, uh, one, so I want to emphasize one thing, Okay, that we must recall that this also happened, that remember that this is not to make Jews play chess. Judaism and chess had it really easy in one way, that Jew that they didn't have to teach Jews chess, right? Judaism was, a, chess was a Jewish thing for a long time before that. In fact, for example, here on the left, we have the first chess <laughs> problem published in a Jewish paper and uh, uh, in a Jewish paper, it's July 1888. Here on the right, we have a book, a primer in chess written in originally in Hebrew in 1809. But in this, by the way, this 1878 edition, as you can see, 
it's actually printed, as was popular at the time in popular Jewish books, printed in the original text, in this case in Hebrew, and below that in Yiddish, right? Very, very common thing, which shows that this was actually a popular thing for all uh, the Jews. One last thing about this, it is interesting that chess in Judaism was viewed as slightly badly, so to speak, slightly negatively, precisely for the same reason, for the exact and opposite reason as chess and Zionism, that it is not because it is in the diaspora, but because you should study the Torah instead, right? And, and we should notice that just like in Islam, chess was allowed, was treated better than other games, but you better just study the Torah, right? It's allowed, but don't, don't overdo it. So uh, we will, in, this, in the lesson of this lesson, we will discuss both the outward and the inward uh, parts, right? The outward presenting Palestine to Israel, seven Jewish studies, uh, inviting famous Jewish players, periodicals with English sections, collaboration, even in serious degree with Arab countries, not just with Jews, but also with Arab countries and other foreign countries, the Olympiads, the Maccabias, which are international tournaments, and all that showing Jews as uh, Zionist, Zionist chess as the vanguard of, of Jewish chess. And then in work, which is what the, uh, Professor Shachar is, uh, is going to do right now, is to present part of the chess as part of the Zionist project, the language war to play chess in Hebrew, tournaments, chess clubs, live games, and all the actual day-to-day -day activity of chess in Palestine, which was strengthening it as a Zionist project in the eyes of the Zionist leadership. Palestine. So, Shafa, you. So, as you may know, um, Hebrew was a nearly dead language for about 2,000 years. And one of the great struggles of the Zionist movement was to establish Hebrew as a day to day language. So, this is a struggle when we talk about uh, everyday language in coffee houses. And, it is even more when we talk about more jargonized speech, when we talk about, for example, academic work. This is actually something that we still have to this day. What language should we talk in the Hebrew Academy when we talk about chemistry or physics? Should we talk Hebrew? Should we talk English? Should we use a sort of uh, Hebrew when we say instead of academy, we say academia and, and so on, but it's basically still foreign. And, and so that was a very big struggle from the beginning. So already in the 20s, Shaul Goldman, who was a prominent uh, chess player in uh, Jerusalem, he was uh, for a very long period, the best chess player in Jerusalem, and also the head of the APC Bank in Jerusalem. He published a letter asking for um, chess fans to come up with new names for the different um, for the different uh, terms in chess, for example, uh, gambit. Uh, how do you actually call just a game? For example, here, what we see here, it, uh, it's an attempt at uh, Hebrewizing uh, chess. But the first word that appears there in, for a game is paltia, which is basically something that you take from uh, many foreign languages, the French. And uh, by the way, still, it's still when I read the. A chess posts by uh, that are translated by Google from Russian, and uh, I always see this word. It still appears to this day, and so uh, so people started coming up with chess terms already in the 1920s. So this uh, example has to do with the notation. So um, chess players can just talk to each other without seeing a board and just talk about the pieces using the notation. So for example, if I say e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, we all know it's the Spanish opening. Uh, and this is uh, very common among chess players, but the Hebrew alphabet is different. It's not H, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, going all the way to H, as you see here, it's actually Aleph, Bet, Gimel, going on to Chet. And apart from that, Hebrew is also written right to left. So, there were two sort of stages, so, or maybe even three if you want, uh, with uh, the way that this notation progressed. So there was uh, an attempt to uh, have it in Hebrew all the way, meaning right to left. But what that produced was 
that if I try to talk to someone about a chess game, then it, it's sort of a mirror image because you, you switch it from left to right, to right to left. So it became very, very confusing. So people understood quite quickly that going this far would not be a good idea. And so they did um, use the Hebrew alphabet, but just used it in the same manner as it is in the English alphabet, going left to right. So instead of A, you have Aleph, instead of B, you have B. So this specific uh, part of the news, uh, newspaper, it has to do with the, this attempt, a mirror image, an attempt that definitely failed. And so uh, they, uh, the, the rest of the papers and, and chess games uh, presented it uh, left to right. Now in 1932, uh, the Jewish uh, Zionist Language Committee, Vad al appointed a subcommittee to give chess terms in, uh, uh, to, in Hebrew. And uh, the committee was headed by two, Ma'amor Wash, that you've already heard about, and Chaim Nachman Bialik, the national poet of Israel. Chaim Nachman Bialik was an avid chess fan and a very important Zionist figure, uh, considered to this day to be the national poet of Israel. And uh, he was uh, very important in coming up with chess terms in Hebrew and giving uh, these chess terms his stamp of approval as part of the Zionist establishment and such a well-known author. And of course, his facility with language was very instrumental in finding words that actually work, just like what I said about the notation. Uh, the, the notation going uh, right to left was too hard for people. And the same uh, was with language. So uh, for example, they tried to give, uh, there's a chess term called fork, and, and they tried to use uh, uh, a word, malgez. Uh, they tried to do some sort of, to change their letters in some sort. And it's still used, by the way, to, for a forklift, you call it malgeza to this day, but that did not catch on. And then in the same, uh, by the same token, for example, the Hebrew terms for mate uh, was mat, and the Hebrew term for uh, still, still mate was pat, and that corresponds with Hebrew because these words actually came originally from Semitic languages and uh, sort of came back uh, to these. Uh, so here you can see Bialik. Maybe I'll just point him out. Okay, here he is, Bialik. He is playing uh, in a simultaneous exhibition. Uh, the man who is giving the simultaneous exhibition is Akiva Rubinstein. He was a world chess uh, championship contender, one of the strongest players to ever play the game, adored to this day. Still, you have competition uh, commemorating him to this day. And he came in 1931 and gave a simultaneous exhibition. We'll talk about it more later. And Bialik was one of the uh, people who were in attendance. And uh, the headline uh, in the newspaper that they said the clash of geniuses, the own Pagabu uh, the own, the two geniuses, Akiba Rubinstein and Chaim Nachman Birak. Let's go on to the next one. So, another way to promote chess and connect it to the Zionist project was in, um, in establishing many tournaments. So, for example, here we see a page from Moshe Cherniak. We mentioned him before, a very important figure in Israeli chess, from Moshe Cherniak's notebook that we were fortunate enough uh, to get from an antique store in Jerusalem. Uh, he was uh, very meticulous, very perfectionist, writing all his uh, scores, his games, and the chess uh, tournament's standings uh, in his notebook. You can see here he wrote it in his uh, Polish, and this is uh, from uh, a chess tournament, intercity chess tournament between Jerusalem and uh, Tel Aviv. And so from the 1930s, we have national championships. We have uh, the Palestinian uh, championships uh, in Israel. We have tournaments, uh, city tournaments, intercity tournaments, and so on and so forth. I want to quote uh, something from, uh, no, no, this one, there's something that I have here from uh, uh, Mayor Dizengoff, who was the first mayor uh, of Tel Aviv. And he came to the tournament that was held in the Levant Fair, the Yerida Mizrach, that was held in 1932 
uh, in Tel Aviv. It was a huge event and, uh, and the mayor came to congratulate the players. And he said two things that are very symbolic of what we're talking about here. First of all, he said, chess is a symbol of free competition and a place where every nation has the right to show its creativity and ability, which the Jewish nation is also demanding. So we can see exactly the theme that we are talking about in our book, in this lecture today, the way that the Jewish people is entitled to do all the things that every other nation is entitled to do. And chess is just an example of that. And the second thing that he said, in chess, the simple pawn goes up and climbs to become a queen when he reaches the last rank. I don't know if you're aware of this rule in chess, when a pawn, which is the most inferior piece on the board, reaches the last rank, he can become anything, including becoming a queen, which is the uh, strongest piece. And so he said, uh, thus, going up and climbing is the main thing. That is, immigrating to Palestine is the most important thing. So he sort of uh, compares the way that a pawn is promoted to a knight or a queen to the way that uh, one fulfills his life mission by immigrating to Israel and becoming uh, a Zionist. And, uh, uh, another very important thing is the establishment of uh, different clubs. So, uh, for example, here we can see uh, from uh, 1923 uh, the establishment of the Emmanuel Lasker Chess Club uh, in, um, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, Moliville is uh, uh, quoted as saying in the paper, he says, the number of members is about 60. The era of establishing ourselves is over. This is 1923, it's already over. From now on, we are on the path of safe and steady improvement. Our hope is that the young club will grow strong and will proudly hold high the flag of the Jewish chess in Zion. And clubs, as I said before, were established all over the country. So there were three, the three main cities, Tel Aviv, had Mamorosh, uh, and then uh, in, uh, in Haifa, there was uh, Israel Yosef Kniazer, who was the head of the club, and uh, in Jerusalem, Moliville that we spoke about, and all these clubs continue to prosper. Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, another way of popularizing the game, as well as connecting it to the Zionist endeavor, is by using live games. What are live games? Can you switch to the next one? I'm going back. So you can see a live game here. So you, you do it in a stadium or in a park, and you have people, actors, uh, being the different pieces. And uh, it can be a show or an exhibition or an actual game. And then you, you tell the, the knight, for example, move now to knight F3, for example, and, you, and the, the actor playing the knight moves and so on, sort of what happens in Harry Potter, right? There's this uh, scene. So we can go back to the previous one. Uh, we had. And so this one is for uh, a live game that was in 1924, Passover. Uh, and it says, a big sports uh, exhibition, live chess. And, uh, and, and also the police band will accompany this, uh, this live performance. 1,500 seats are available. And the reports that we read after the uh, after the show is that 10,000 people uh, arrived. I don't know, it sounds like a lot, but that's what they reported. Among them, thousands of Arabs, according to uh, the report. So uh, even something that is a sort of a shared living kind of event. And uh, also worth noting is that the costumes for the, the actors who played the pieces were made by the uh, Betzal El graduates from the Jerusalem Art School, uh, uh, Jerusalem Art School that is still considered one of the best in Israel to this day, uh, after the name of the first Jewish ar artist, Betzal El, who is mentioned in the Bible as, to, as making the Ark of the Covenant. And so, um, and in this game, we see here, that's in Haifa, 1927, we see uh, a live game again. This time, it, the, the actors, are presented as uh, rebels, Jewish rebels fighting the Romans. And in this game, actually, the Jewish rebels won, unlike in history. And then uh, the next one, we see a very uh, funny kind of, <laughs> of advertisement for the, uh, it's, it's supposed to be a live chess match 
Rubinstein playing Marble Wash. Uh, we already mentioned Akiba Rubinstein, uh, a world chess championship contender, and Marble Wash, uh, the head of the chess club in Tel Aviv. And they had a big event uh, in 1931 where uh, there were actors playing the pieces and they actually played a real game, it wasn't just an exhibition. And I think the main achievement that we see uh, in this uh, poster is that the chess is in a bigger font and before introducing the football match that is going to be between the two cities. I think if, if you manage to be before football, then that's a big achievement in itself. One. Who won? Uh, actually, Rubenstein won, and in a very nice uh, game. And um, and so, um, and yeah. By the way, it's it's Hapoel. If you can figure it out, Hapoel is the name as we saw the organization. Hapoel and Ram. That's supposed to be G R O U N D. Okay. <laughs> it's full of mistakes. Uh, full of and with the Chase champion. We did also the L from Hapoel. Yeah, it's 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 a nice one yeah. for sure. Uh, and another way, as I said before, promoting the game is by simultaneous exhibitions. And people like Marmo Roche and Molly Ver, uh, just went all around the country giving simultaneous exhibitions in order to promote the game and show that this is not just about the chess, but also about uh, raising the spirits of people around the country and so on. So we can see here, for example, the uh, Asher Bevesti, the, the, they, they they uh, translate a uh, champion as Natschan here. Whoever knows Hebrew uh, will find that pretty funny. Uh, and, um, and this is a ticket for his simultaneous display. And on the left, we see Mamosh, who gave many uh, simultaneous exhibitions throughout the country to promote, uh, to promote chess. Now, another way of connecting uh, chess to Zionism. Yeah, sure. Well done. So another way is to present uh, the chess players as uh, em embodiments of Zionism. So, for example, we see here on the right, uh, Josef Borat. His name in Germany was Heinz Falder, and uh, he was a very strong uh, Jewish player in Germany. But when the Nazis rose, he began to feel the heat and uh, in, uh, in 1933, he moved to Lithuania for a year to study, to, uh, to train as a farmer, to study agriculture before he came to Israel, where he became a farmer first in Wutz Hefziba and then in uh, Ramot Shavim. And he was one of the strongest players in Israel for years and uh, Israeli chess champion for a few times. And in addition, he was always a farmer. So that's, that's uh, what, what is expected from a Zionist chess player, to be a man of the land. On the other hand, Mona Kaf that we see on the left, she was in Palestine for uh, a few, uh, for a little while, and then she immigrated to the USA and uh, became the US chess champion. So that's a source of pride. Women's, women's chess champion, sorry. The USA women's chess champion. And, uh, and then, and that's a source of, of pride, but when she is presented in the Jewish press, she is still called a Palestinian player. And the fact that she moved to the US is sort of not uh, emphasized very much. And if, if I want to give an even more extreme example, Mona Kauf, she's, uh, <coughs> they are still proud of, then in 1932, one of the strong masters who came from Germany was Ezra Glass. He came and he played the Maccabiah. And most of the people who played that Maccabiah stayed in Israel. They did not go back. And he, of all people, in 1932, decided to go back to Germany. And then uh, when, the, when it became unbearable with the Nazi regime, he fled to China, Shanghai, came back to uh, uh, Israel, stayed for a few years, and in the 1950s, again, moved to Germany. And he was ignored by uh, chess historians, chess press, because of that betrayal of not staying and going back to Germany. He's probably very attached to his country. You can see that by the way, he kept returning them despite the difficulties, but uh, this was not, this was frowned upon and he was basically uh, uh, wiped out of the, um, of the chess history, of the Jewish chess history. And finally, um, 
another way of connecting uh, to Zionism was through the connection to the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, the army. We're talking about uh, 1948 and onwards, of course, because there is no IDF before that. And so, for example, here we can see on the left uh, an ad uh, that gives soldiers all kinds of ways to uh, of leisurely activities. And one of them is a simultaneous exhibition. It's uh, the last one there. And on the right, we can see uh, Yitzhak Aloni, one of the strongest players in Israel, giving a simultaneous uh, display to uh, soldiers. Uh, again, they're not just avid chess fans. They want to help and they from, uh, raise the spirits of the soldiers. Uh, go ahead to the next one. And the next one is sort of a funny one. You can see here a portable chess set advertisement uh, where uh, it says that this is very good for reserve duty. So when you go on reserve duty in Israel, all the men have to do that. So you can take your portable chess set with you and play with your friends. Go ahead. That's right. So Shaha, uh, after Shaha gave us a very, very good idea of how Zionism tried to connect to chess to the Jewish community in Palestine, later in Israel. And now the second part, as we saw, is output. How do you connect it to Jewish chess players abroad? And the goal again, let us see, right, that to our to my slide. The idea is that you connect it through showing Palestine as the center of Judaism, that's the Zionist ethos, the Jewish nation, and in particular, showing it as the center of Jewish chess. Right? The Zionist players, just like all other Zionists, are pioneers and leaders of the world, world Jewish chess players, the Zionist ideal. Diaspora Jewish players, just like diaspora Jews in general, are encouraged to contribute their share to advance the center, right? Ideally, to emigrate to Palestine or to Israel, but if not that, then at least you know to, to participate in other ways, to give not so much money, chess players don't have money, but to come and play in Israel and show the exhibitions, to contribute games, contribute problems, contribute articles, right? And do anything you can to contribute to chess in Israel, to come and play in tournaments, right? To do all you can to connect the Jews to uh, the Jews of the diaspora to Palestine, right? The Jews as in Palestine is an avant-garde, right? And this is seen also in 1923 already that the eyes of many Jewish chess enthusiasts in the diaspora are upon us, right? We are here and they're all looking at us. Whether this is in fact true or not, that's another story. But they actually did everything they could to do as much as they can about that. And how? And this is the next question. First of all, there was a great appeal and a lot of effort went into inviting famous chess, Jewish chess masters into Palestine to come and visit. Here again, Sakiba Rubinstein, who was the really uh, the first person who, who gave uh, such a simultaneous play in 1931, as we saw. By the way, this is the very, the same hall that we saw the picture of, uh, of uh, Rubinstein, and incidentally, uh, Curio, the picture of Rubinstein with Bialik is the actual original photo uh, given to us by uh, Malkos Chokmin. You can see actually Bialik on the left here, if you look very quickly. Here we see in the center, we see Rubinstein walking around the board on the left. Malmolch, who organized bringing, as we saw, he was the really the unofficial <coughs> Ambassador of Israeli mm -hmm. chess, Palestinian chess, uh, in the middle here, uh, who organized bringing Rubinstein. And on the left, uh, this is Wilson, who was the head of the T Tel Aviv chess club, who gave out the formal invitation to uh, Rubinstein, right? Usually it's chess clubs that do that. And you can see a few interesting things. First of all, uh, very, very popular, right? You need lots of people. Lots of people showing up. Second of all, this is a huge hall. This is, in fact, the Beta uh, uh, the official, an official house owned by 
uh, I don't remember by a very important or Zionist body, maybe the Istadult, maybe I don't recall, maybe Tel Aviv uh, municipality. This is an official reception, right? In a big hall, not in a cafe, not in a private club. This is acceptance already, 1931, of Zionism as, of the Zionist uh, community of chess as, as a legitimate action. They would not have accepted, I don't know, a bridge tournament or anything like that, right? This is something that is important to Zionism, accepted as, as important to Zionism. I should add about this game, uh, there is a, not sad, but a bit sort of sarcastic end to that, that when uh, we found uh, an angry letter by a chess player that Rubinstein was mistreated. You see, uh, when he came, when he went out of Palestine, on the ship, taking him to the Est, uh, he was asked by somebody who recognized him whether he was paid. And Rubinstein, who was very naive on these matters, said, no, they didn't pay me yet, but they would say, but they said there would be somebody in the Est from the club who will have the money. The man heard that, and he made a collection, you know, in the ship, and they collected like five pounds, and that was essentially what he got, and they, with that, he sort of managed to get back to... Uh, to to uh, Antwerp, and I believe where we lived, and that we know this because there was a, this was one of those open letters, really, really angry letters. Some things don't change, right? <laughs> uh, and another player, the next player, actually chronologically, main strong player who came to Palestine, was this man, S. Flo, Salo Flo, Czechoslovakian. Again, simultaneous display, B one against sixty people. This time. Again, Flo, of course, Jewish. Uh, you can see by the name, in, in, if you kids you didn't guess otherwise, he was Czechoslovakian. And this was also official, right? This was in a cafe, but it was under the, uh, as you can see here, uh, under the sponsorship of the Czechoslovakian Council, right? And so again, big event. Again, there was, Malmosh was very instrumental in doing this and getting this player. And here we have something very interesting here. Again, that. Uh, here is Flo's signature on what? On the document establishing the Palestinian Chess Association, Jew Palestinian Chess Association. Once again, for the first time, before that, there were clubs, right? There were clubs, there were tournaments, and so on and so forth. But only in 1934, they were established formally a national chess association, the Palestinian Chess Federation, I think, actually, is a better translation. And on that document, which, by the way, was handwritten because they didn't have secretaries to do it, it was handwritten. Everybody signed them, all the club managers and so on and so forth, and also South Law. Uh, South Law, essentially, they, they made, they, they signed it then because Flaw was present. And Flaw here unofficially gives the sanction of Jewish chess players as a strong master of the sanction of Jewish pleasure in the world to this Palestinian association. We agree that you are here. We agree that you are our leader, right? You are the avant garde. And he was there signing it. And that's okay. Next one. The third, another one, another player. This is a shah by, uh, by a man named von J. Mises, Jack Mises. Jack Mises was a Jewish, a Jewish chess player, born in Germany, lived in Austria, eventually, after the war, uh, moved to England, and in fact became England's first official grandmaster. I should have emphasized, what does that mean? You might have heard the term grandmaster. Uh, grandmaster is an official term only from the 1950s when the uh, Federal International Chess Federation started to assign these titles, and he was the first British one because he became a naturalized British citizen, and it was named Chuck. I, how this, don't I can't figure it out. But the important part is that in the Jewish press, he was always, always, always presented by the Hebrew name Yaakov, and this was another part of Zionism. Not only that, almost all the the chess players that came to Palestine at the time changed their name. For example, Hora Ferdel. So I've changed his name from Heinz Ferdel to, uh, to Porat. Many others changed their name as well. Schechter to, uh, Aloni. to Aloni, uh, Boynik to Oren. Doesn't matter, I won't go through the whole names. But also, whenever 
Jews were mentioned from abroad, Jewish playgroups were mentioned abroad, they were always mentored by their Jewish name, always Yaakov Mises. Incidentally, we're here in Oxford, there's a slightly well-known philosopher called Isaiah, right? By Berlin, in, in Israel, always Ishaya, not Isaiah, it's not Ishaya, always Judah is rejected, always the Jewish one, right? Okay, so that's one thing. And he's important not only because he came to Palestine as a strong player, again, with Martin interpretation. One of the reasons that Momosh came to the Olympiads in 1935, we won't go into that. He did uh, a lot of propaganda work for chess in Palestine. But not only was he a strong chess player, he also had a chess column, a popular chess column in the Yudhisha Lundschau in Vienna, right, where he regularly spoke about chess and he also often, well, not that often, but he not only came to Palestine, but he also declared how he uh, talked about his visit and it, it, it introduced, in German, right? it introduced Jewish chess players, the Yudhisha Lundschau, or read by Jews, uh, to the Jewish players, to chess in Palestine, who these people are, to what he thinks about the country, in particular, once again, Mohilevel as the ambassador, he published, this is from his chess column, Mises playing against Mohilevel, and Mises winning again. Mohilevel had the job of being the fall guy, right, of losing to the strong master. He was a strong player, but not on that level. We're talking here like top 10 players. But the important point was that he came and, and uh, played, and these games were published, and this way he was introduced to the world. Okay, um, next slide. So we see this, and here is the, here is something I understand, another thing, periodicals. Chess periodicals in Palestine, okay? They are, I should add, the historians, the archivists' dream. On the one hand, the bad news, they are, all these are named, these are three completely different uh, uh, journals, 1923, 1932, and 1936, uh, in this uh, 23, 24, 1932, and 1936, by different people, uh, all named by the original name, Hashachmat, the chess. But the good news is, they all lasted only a few issues, so you never have a problem which one it is, right? <laughs> very, very clear, very, very obvious. And the important part is that these periodicals were from the very start seen, not just as <clears throat> giving news from about chess to mm -hmm. Palestinian chess players, but as propagandizing uh, for chess abroad by having English or German or foreign language sections, right? That was very important. And also, on the other hand, by suggesting and asking and essentially begging player, Jewish players to contribute from abroad, to contribute. And this is in fact what happened. Just for an example, in the first one, the, the one on the right, this is the, was 1923, 1924, was published, this Hashachmat was published with the last word chess club by the editor by Mohilafil, right? It says explicitly here that the great chess, the great Jewish chess players abroad have promised their, their constant participation in the journal, which in fact they did, which in fact they did. Uh, these, these articles, uh, Shachmat did publish articles written specifically for it by uh, famous Jewish players, uh, such, right? And uh, players like Rubinstein, Mises, <coughs> right? And many others, I mean, if you don't know the names, doesn't matter, many other uh, players did in fact uh, contribute articles, interestingly, uh, uh, Rubinstein wrote his article originally in Hebrew. He was a yeshiva bocha as a young man, and he wrote in Talmudic Tal Hebrew his entire uh, chess article. And that's one thing. And the second thing, which is quite interesting, there is also something known as chess problems, right? The difference between chess problems and chess, and chess as you know, you know, to play people play, is a bit like the difference between, let me explain very briefly, between 
uh, how can I say, between prose and poetry. Problems are composed positions, very unrealistic positions that try to show something beautiful that white has to mate black in exactly two moves, for example. They're essentially like poetry as opposed to prose, right? I mean, and it's a whole different field. And interestingly enough, for example, in Ashraqat, I'll just back to Ashraqat for a minute, okay? Uh, Ashraqat, for example, not only that many uh, Jewish problemists publish uh, Jewish chess problems, but also, for example, one of the players, the, one of the problems, the Polish Jewish uh, uh, problems, Schmidt Speisel, it, it, it uh, published a, pro, uh, a problem explicitly for the revival, dedicated to the revival of chess life in Palestine, in Eretz Israel. And he deliberately composed the problem so that the pieces on the board will look like a Star of David. Right? That is uh, occasionally done to commemorate uh, that. And this is just one example. And people did compose and said they do. The whole point was look by coming to this, by coming, by contributing to us, you are <coughs> the scientist. An extreme case, and Shachal just moved to uh, correctly to uh, the case of periodicals. Here we have the bulletin of the Problemist Association in Palestine in the middle and on the right. This was, funds were so limited then that here is, for example, a problem. You see that the pieces are in, uh, you know, different uh, places, right, John? Can you show? I'm sorry, I believe the camera doesn't seem, are like not in the regular position. These were actually printed physically with stamps, right? With stamps that were put in ink physically, and then this was stenciled. This makes this technically a manuscript. Right, we're talking about 1941. This is technically a manuscript, handwritten, and then stenciled. And this was the way it was published in the early 1940s. And then, out of the blue, right, 1945, a few issues were published like this: half typewritten, half manuscript. And all of a sudden, on the left, the bulletin of the Palestine Problemist Association, five pounds. Uh, five uh, shillings, I believe, per year, right? Nobody would pay five pounds for that, certainly not in 1945. Printed where, if all places, by Jay McClure in West, in Jay McClure in Scotland. Why on earth would they print the magazine of the Jewish, of the Palestinian Problemist Association in English in Scotland in a wonderful level place? Because Jewish, uh, Scottish Jewish chess players and activists decided to help Palestinian chess in this way. This is one of those almost absurd things that, that we see here. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Next slide, yes. This continued, this continued also, by the way, during the time of the state of Israel. Here is the first uh, journal of the of the, of, of the Israeli Chess Federation, not named Hashachmat, that had a bad, that chess, that had a bad uh, record, but named simply Shachmat Chess, another original name. And it actually lasted uh, <coughs> for more than 50 years, not a couple of issues. Uh, the last, uh, ironically, the last, literally the last article in the last, and the last issue was mine, uh, a biography of Shermi. I, I killed that journal completely. They decided that if I'm publishing there, <laughs> right? But, uh, and you can see here something very interesting. On the left, we have an issue from 1964. In 1964, in Israel, was the Chess Olympiad. That is well known, and yes, it has games for the Olympiad, but it had a huge, like one third of the, of the, of the issue was about two other tournaments in Israel at the same time. The tournaments that the assumption was that most people interested in chess would know about the Olympiad Games anyway from other sources, but they would not otherwise know how chess is developing in Israel in other strong tournaments taking place at the same time. So as you can see from, uh, 
from the head of the from the um, uh, headline the success of Israel's youth not in the Olympiad but in other <coughs> tournaments taking place at the same time and that it was look how we are doing look how we are doing and here is what happened and amazingly this happened also in the case with not only towards Jews but also towards other countries on the left, in the middle here, for example, we have Rabbi Citron playing chess with Stutz, the non-Jewish, the non-Jewish uh, governor of Jerusalem during the British mandate. Chess was actually also used as that, as a bridge between nations. On the right, we have an interesting man. His name was von Weizen. He did a few things in his life. He was a doctor, a physician, a psychiatrist, Jabotinsky II in command, uh, an officer in the First World War in the Austro-Hungarian uh, Austro uh, army, one of two Jews there, a, command, a battalion commander in 1948 War of Independence. Uh, also, uh, and also he was known as the, a chess champion, a chess champion, and also the Jewish Lawrence of Arabia. He was a personal friend of me as a German correspondent. He was of a German newspaper correspondent. He was a personal friend of many uh, Arab leaders and met them and also played chess with them and spread chess among them. And also he, another thing in terms of Zionism, he organized a chess match on the Zeppelin. When? When the Zeppelin was flying over Palestine I believe it was 1928, right? And you can imagine the situation, 1928, Mahmoud was just sitting there giving simultaneous displays in some workers' clubs, and von Weissel was drinking champagne and playing chess on Zeppelin up there. That's the difference between these guys. By the way, uh, von Weissel, uh, how can you be all of that? Uh, von Weissel uh, used to say that he, there are 24 hours a day, 12, you know, 12 hours of, uh, of light, and he wakes up an hour earlier, so uh, you know, 37 hours. No problem. Another and very important case, the next one. Now on the left. This is a very interesting, this is a notebook by uh, Eliezer Peel. Eliezer Peel was the non captain of the Israeli chess team to the Valna 1962 Olympiad. Due to all kinds of internal politics, he was not, in fact, a strong player. He was a fan, but not a particularly strong player. But due to all kinds of political reasons, he was nominated as the captain. In any case, he didn't spend his time playing chess there because it wasn't strong enough to help the players to analyze games <clears> and so <throat> forth. He went around collecting signatures, among other things. He had the notebook, and every country collected signatures. This notebook has the signatures of 50 or 60 grandmasters and, and of six world champions, past, present, and future. Here on the left, for example, the top signature is B. Fisher, right? Which is Bobby Fisher. It's quite interesting. His actual name was Robert, but he actually signed it B. Fisher, right? I mean, uh, interesting issue. But that, more important to our purposes, are these two uh, pages on the, on, the, on, the, on the right. This is Tunis and Lebanon. And this is 1962. Neither Tunis and Lebanon have any sort of peace agreement with Israel. In fact, they still don't, right? As you well know. And nevertheless, all the players agreed to sign. And this was perhaps the very first time players, uh, Arab and Jews, played together. Another, this is how far chess, uh, chess could bridge differences. By the way, yes, the next one. Mamosh <coughs> played chess with Abdallah, Emir Abdallah in the Jordan, right, of Transjordan. Many times there are lots of stories about chess which are stories, which are legends. This is the actual letter by Mamosh to his sister, which we found, which describes the visit. Abdallah sent his Rolls Royce, his air conditioned Rolls Royce, this is 1930s Palestine, right? To Tel Aviv to take him to Amman. And in these two letters, uh, he says that he played, first of all, he played with uh, his uh, advisors, right? First, he played regular chess with them and beat them all. 
And then they explain to him that no, this is what he says here, they don't play regular chess. They were still playing shatranj, chess by the old medieval Arab rules, a much weaker system <coughs> and so on and so forth. We won't go into the differences. Chess as it was played in 1200 before it became the modern game. Okay. And he was explained the rules and he played with them again and still beat them all, which is pretty cool. And, uh, and you can see here that Abdallah and Abdallah uh, received them warmly and said that my house is always open to you. And it was a very, very interesting thing, Jews and Arabs together. This is you know, two years before the great Arab revolt and so on. So we're not talking about time when it was easy. Big, big deal. Yes. Finally, we have the Olympiads and the Maccabeans. One of those one time, for the first time in 2000 years issues is, of course, for the first time in 2000 years, the Jews are coming in their own team, as their own team, to an international event. And in this case, that's precisely what they have. They did. In 1935, the Palestine, Palestine meaning the British mandate of Palestine, sent a Jewish a, a chess team to represent the British mandate of Palestine, all Jews, of course, right? We're talking about the Jewish uh, Palestine here. And this was a huge propaganda blitz of success for uh, chess in, in, in Palestine, not only internally, because this was always, always important for the first time in 2000 years, we have a team. It was one of the first, if not the first time indeed, that a team of Jews participated from Palestine, participated in an international event. Uh, but also, right, externally, Mahmoud came as a reporter and did many simultaneous displays there to Jews in the area in Varsha. It was in Varsha, right, in 1936, right? Not yet, yeah, 1935. My mistake. Uh, in there, in Varsha, <coughs> to Jews there, and, you know, did everything he had to make them to come to Palestine and so on and so forth. Uh, that's one thing. So again, we have it both ways. By the way, one of the things is the Palestinian team did quite badly. It was 11 out of 14 or something like that. But for a Zionist reason, uh, Marmorsh, when he reported the reports, when he reported the table in the Jewish press in Palestine, he reported the reports alphabetically so that it will be hard for the readers to understand uh, how badly the Palestinian team did. This was done deliberately. You know, to, to, when you, when you don't do well, that's right, to hide it, okay? And more crucially, perhaps more tragically, is the story, not just from the second, the story of the 1939 Olympiad. This is the, the Jewish, the Palestinian team to the 1939 Olympiad. Uh, it was known as the, uh, it was an Olympiad where the ship that brought players from Europe to, Pal to uh, the Olympiad in Buenos Aires was known as, was known as uh, Noah's Ark because essentially it saved them from the Holocaust, right? And uh, the war actually broke out in, during the Olympiad. And ironically, it was decided that nations in war will end the games with the 2-2 two -two turn. Ironically, the Germans wanted to play Palestine uh, under the excuse that uh, Germany is not at war with uh, Palestine. The real reason was that Palestine had a relatively weak team and they wanted to take advantage of that. Uh, the Jews, uh, of course, the Palestinian players with no circumstances would have agreed to play. Uh, how this was solved is another issue. We don't have time to go into that, but shows how ironic it is. I should emphasize, it's not that the German teams were Nazis, right? They too, almost all of them were just players and intellectuals, they all stayed in Buenos Aires after the, the war too. We're not talking here about a fanatical Nazi, but still, right? In fact, in 1955, when Israeli team in the Olympiad agreed to play with West Germany, this was a huge scandal. I have to do that. Again, not because the players themselves were Nazis, but even giving it much. And also we have uh, the Olympiads and the Maccabias. We also have the Maccabias in 1932, 1935. There were Maccabias, which were uh, the Jewish Olympians in all teams. And for example, again, in 1935, 
in the Maccabeans, we have chess. Again, an acceptance of chess as legitimate, as a sport, as something for the Jews, not just running or swimming or whatever. Right? And, and what happened was that numerous Jews used the Maccabea in general and the chess tournament of the Maccabea in particular to escape from Europe, to get visas to Palestine and stay. Here's one of those players, Yaakov Zilboshat. He and his brother were supposedly Luxembourg's top Jewish players, which actually could technically be true, considering the fact how many Jews are there in Luxembourg anyway. Right? <laughs> but, uh, and they arrived, and he and his brother got a visa to Palestine that way. They lost all their games except for the game between each other. Somebody had to win. And then port, this was expected because it was just a way to get out of the country. And what is important, interesting, is that in the Jewish press, the results of all the other players were reported, but their reports, their games were not reported. Not because they were ashamed that they lost games, but to not give a hint to the British, we suspect, that they are here, that they're staying here. In fact, it was it was became known as the Aliyah Maccabea because almost all the players, including the brass band that played in the opening ceremony, stayed in Palestine after the war and thus saved their lives. Uh, so in this way, we have, and here we're finishing, in this way, what happens is that chess became silenced, both from the outside and from the inside, both towards the Jews in Palestine and towards the Jews in the world. It became a Zionist endeavor. And the culmination of this was that the actual the decision to uh, have the 1964 Olympiad in Palestine, in Israel. Here we see David Ben-Gurion speaking in his mother tongue, Russian, right, with the Jewish, with the Russian team, which won the Olympiad. Okay, and here he is. He is giving the, uh, the uh, cup, the winning cup, uh, to Alexander Kotov, the Jewish, uh, the head of the team. And the one of the things is before we saw him speaking in Botswana, who was right. in world class. He had no problems. Uh, uh, by the way, speaking of that, and to finish with that, uh, the last thing we will do here are advertisement inside. Just one second. In chess, in the Israeli chess magazine. The interesting one is that uh, the one on the right here is for television, for an Israeli made television by an Israeli company, Zionist. The one problem, this is 1964, there, were no, so there was no television broadcast in Israel. <laughs> but they did use it as testing ground for closed circuit TV. They actually had uh, Israeli television as closed circuit TV, and uh, that was also part of the Zionist dream. Uh, so, to sum up, chess in Israel developed in the 1920s to 1960s from a hobby of a number of avid fans to a sport in which Israel was the best, had the best achievements, even though it lacked monetary support and was developed by its enthusiasts as a Zionist project, and they Zionist the game, both to the Jews in Palestine and to the Jews of the diaspora, beacon to, to, to presenting Israel as a beacon to diaspora Jewry, fighting the language war in favor of Hebrew, connecting to the IDF, and proving proof that Jews can organize championships, competitions, and so on, and even an Olympiad, and making chess one of the Zionist mainstream. And right, uh, this, by the way, thanks for listening. This, by the way, is the 1945 Palestine Championship uh, with all the top players. In, in they're all the thanking you, so thank you. They're all thanking you. <laughs> and uh, thanking you for running a bit over time. And uh, thank Shahal as well for presenting. We are now taking questions.